I want to tell you about our upcoming event, December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, right here in Santa Barbara. Saturday, we're going to have uh, podcast recordings. I've got uh, Michael Schellenberger coming, the independent journalist who worked on the Twitter files, as well as other big issues, homelessness, nuclear power. He's uh, really an interesting uh, fellow. Pete Bogosian is going to do his street epistemology with us. On Sunday, I have Jared Diamond coming up from L.A. We're going to record a live podcast uh, episode with him as well, and you'll be participating. Much of the time will be spent with just uh, questions and comments from the audience. So it's going to be big, big fun. We've got a fundraising dinner on Saturday night. Uh, it's a beautiful resort, this whole area. Well, Santa Barbara, come on. People pay to come here on vacation, and you can too, and get uh, some great um, knowledge from interesting people as well. So check it out. December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, right here in Santa Barbara. My guest today is Benham Ben Tablu, a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, FDD, where he focuses on Iranian security and political issues. Benham previously served as a research fellow and senior Iran analyst at FDD. Prior to his time in FDD, Benham worked on nonproliferation issues at an arms control think tank in Washington. Leveraging his subject matter expertise and native Farsi skills, Benham has closely tracked a wide range of Iran-related topics, including nuclear nonproliferation, ballistic missile sanctions, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the foreign and security policy of the Islamic Republic, and internal Iranian politics. Frequently called upon to brief journalists, congressional staff, and other Washington audiences. Benham has also testified before the U.S. Congress and Canadian Parliament. Yeah, he's one of those deep state guys. He was in the room when all this stuff happened. You've seen him on the, uh, read him in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Reuters, Fox News, Associated Press, and so on and so forth. And his uh, writings have appeared in um, the BBC News, Fox News, oh, uh, uh, C-SPAN, Defense News, and so on and so forth. Okay. Benham, thanks so much for coming on. I've done a couple of episodes on uh, Israel. Now I want to, you know, kind of expand out a little bit to talk about the other countries in the area, particularly Iran, since that subject has been coming up recently. Thanks for coming on to talk to me. I know you're busy. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, great to be with you, and uh, thank you for the very kind intro. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, it's right off your webpage, and it's impressive. But I, I left out some of it, quite a bit of it, actually. You're quite accomplished in this area. Yes. Yeah, so before we get into Iran, maybe you could just kind of Give us an overview of what you think is going on. Why did this happen October 7th, not two years ago or two years from now or whatever, and and uh, what your overall impressions are so far? Uh, I should say we're recording this on November 2nd, since stories change by the hour and day here. Uh, that's right. It is a very fast-moving story. Uh, and even though you, you were attempting to place it, uh, allow me to move the dial back a bit further and place it... Uh, somewhere in the 50th, uh, 50 years ago, uh, with the actual 1973 Yom Kippur War. And uh, some friends and colleagues and folks in Washington used to make fun of me for over-focusing on the 73 war. Uh, you know, in, in Washington, in the transatlantic world, definitely in Europe, the 67 war is the war that's all the rage in academia, in the policy space. Uh, but if you look at Israel's adversaries in the Middle East, many of the lessons they learned about how to contest the Jewish state, how to fight the Jewish state, actually stems from the 1973 war. And there is a line that, unfortunately, I feel like even some in Israel have forgotten. And it was a line that then Egyptian President Anwar Sadat used to say. And in fact, I believe he said it as the, opera the military operations uh, during Yom Kippur 1973 were going on, which was, Quote, I wanted to prove that the Israeli theory of security would collapse. Oh, wow. And uh, it, it's not to make it sound more intellectual than it even needs to be, but the way Israel defends itself, he was trying to prove that that itself was not sustainable. Uh, and you're seeing that precisely now, 50 years later, with the way the Islamic Republic has been able to array a whole series of militias and terror groups and armed groups across a whole host of different jurisdictions of weak central authority, collapsed states, failed states, and through the chaos that the Middle East traditionally presents itself, through that fog of war, be able to create and co-opt groups and have them have a different kind of projectile that penetrates the fog of war and is ultimately aimed at the Jewish state. So here, you know, you talked about the non-proliferation stuff in my background. I tend to focus on that whole array of threats. You know, Iran has been home to the biggest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East, bigger than Israel, bigger than NATO ally Turkey, bigger than U.S. partner Saudi Arabia. 
the old dividing lines of the Middle East where the good guys, for lack of a better word, had jets and the bad guys, for lack of a better word, uh, had missiles or scuds. That was one way you could kind of tell which way the, the winds were blowing. And it's not just states anymore, it's these armed groups. And uh, in some places, Iran is overtly giving these armed groups uh, weapons, uh, like in Yemen, for instance, the, the Houthis in Yemen, which is a rebel group that Iran has supported since at least 2014, they took over that state. They have some of the longest range projectiles, stuff that goes over a thousand kilometers. Uh, and they're able to strike Israel now from Yemeni territory. So even though, you know, you and your guests have talked a lot about the Hamas-Israel, Gaza-Israel paradigm, it is, as you mentioned, a much broader regional chessboard. And Iran has this entire, you know, uh, terrorist group apparatus that it calls the axis of resistance. And it's slowly testing out this new theory of bringing on a different terror group online, uh, sometimes in an effort to bail out uh, a different terror group. So now bringing on the Houthis in Yemen to save Hamas in Gaza. There's a big question dangling over everyone's minds right now. You said we're recording on November 2nd. On November 3rd, the Secretary General of Iran's chief proxy in that part of the world, Lebanese Hezbollah, is designed to give a speech about potentially more or less Hezbollah involvement in that war. Uh, and Iran has another strategy as well with militias in the Middle East, uh, particularly Iraq and Syria, trying to shoot at U.S. positions, U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria, in a bid to drive a wedge between uh, Israel and America, and in a bid to make America afraid of precisely that which uh, our politicians across three different administrations here have said they're afraid of, which is a regional war, uh, escalation, un an unintended and uncontrolled escalation. Uh, and in effect, this is the uh, risk tolerance of Iran and its proxy network on display, and this is the risk aversion uh, of, uh, of America on display. And in, in theoretical terms, uh, we're going to see a lot more of the way these wars are being fought uh, in, in the future. Uh, you know, when many of these proxies say death to Israel, uh, sometimes it's kind of uh, wiped away or ignored. The Houthis, for example, this group in Yemen we just talked about, uh, they were talking about a desire to enter a conflict with Israel, whether it was with the Palestinians and the Israelis or the Israelis and Hezbollah, since 2017. Uh, and many did not take that threat seriously, but Iran gave them the capabilities to act on that threat. So for widening out the regional chessboard here, uh, it's much more important to look at these actors that Iran has arrayed uh, rather than just what's going on, which I know is very important on the land border vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Gaza and Israel and the nature of the evolving land war with the IDF and Hamas. Wow, that makes a lot of sense then. So to the question, what did these Hamas terrorists think they're going to accomplish by going across the border and killing 1,400 people? They had to know there was going to be something big coming back their way. Now it makes more sense. There's a, a longer game plan that Iran backing them has. What is that? And that's certainly, in, in my view, as the, the Iranian patron, if you're going to try to project and understand the regime's intentionality uh, to probably green light this Hamas attack. And uh, unfortunately, I think in the, in the U.S. analytical community and even some in Israel and certainly some in Europe, they've disconnected the dots between patron and proxy. They've disconnected the dots very unhelpfully between Hamas and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, when Iran has been able to fight in so many ways to the last Palestinian, to effectuate its ideological and strategic goals here. So uh, there may be a difference between what Hamas may have wanted. Some of those individual Hamas foot, noter, foot, foot soldiers may have wanted martyrdom. Some of them may have wanted social media glory. You saw grotesque things when the paragliders came in, essentially with GoPros. The individual motivations is the individual motivations of the, uh, someone with a jihadist inclination. It was to fight and kill for a cause they believe in. But the Islamic Republic's instrumental use of these is part of that larger strategy, trying to do the death by a thousand cuts against the Jewish state, but in a way that is very different from the Arab-Israeli wars, the set-piece battles of the Cold War, conventional tank thrusts and things of that nature, and by bringing in online low cost and high return on investment, and that's a really kind of military way to say uh, an asymmetric or a, a, foot, a low-level foot soldier kind of person against a much more technologically superior adversary, but getting around that superior adversary by going against the civilian infrastructure uh, that, that the adversary has. And by killing 1,400 innocent people, it's also designed to provoke a reaction. And this is where that regional context matters much more than the local context, because 
The Islamic Republic has been trying to stop this Arab-Israeli wave of normalization agreements, initially under the auspices of the Abraham Accords. Uh, the last speech of Iran's supreme leader, uh, right before these operations were authorized, uh, so on October 3rd, before the operation happened on October 7th, uh, on October 3rd, Iran's supreme leader threatened again that countries that would seek normalization would pay a price for it. He was trying to say that Israel was on the way out of the region. He's long called Israel a cancerous tumor that has to be excised from the region. And this is a group uh, inside the Islamic Republic, the government of Iran, unfortunately, that has uh, taken the nation of Iran hostage. You can't find a greater dissonance between state and society in the Middle East than in Iran today, where you have uh, the people uh, chanting since 2009, not Gaza, not Lebanon, my life for Iran. And then you have the government of the Islamic Republic uh, basically absconding with the regime's oil wealth and essentially putting it in the hands of its terror proxies. And so the regime wanted to not just do that death by a thousand cuts, not just create images that would create friction in more Arab-Israeli normalization and to stop the Saudi-Israeli normalization, but also it was trying to move the center of gravity away from Iran. You saw even before the Abraham Accords a consensus among moderate Sunni Arab states as well as Israel, you could basically call this the pro-American bloc, with barriers to their cooperation dropping and the convergence of their interests, like a Venn diagram moving closer and closer together. And so Iran wanted the attention off of it and put back towards on Israel. And the way Israel was going about having to fight this, again, if any country suffered a 1,400 person terror attack on the scale and the nature on the relative size that we saw on October 7th, it would be one where you have to push back militarily. And it would be one where you cannot divorce the context of the 2008, the 2012, the 2014 wars, knowing how Hamas fights, the rocket fire, the tunnels, the anti-tank weapons, the improv improvisations, the fact that it's, they literally use human shields. Knowing all of that, I think uh, the Islamic Republic wanted to create images that would make it hard for Arab capitals in Washington to stand together, that would make it hard for Arab capitals in Israel to stand together, and that even if Israel was going to have a military victory, that it would not be able to have a political victory. Uh, and I think wow. that was the very grotesque long-term goal uh, that they were seeking to effectuate. Well, the Iranian uh, regime must love watching the American and Western leftists proclaim, you know, death to Israel and gas all the Jews and we support Palestine. Even the gays for Palestinians. I mean, what are you thinking? <laughs> this is incredible. Um, they are anti-gay. What I just really don't get this. But now it there's that a lot kind of folks of not sense. thinking. I think not thinking. Yes. Well, I do wonder about that. Just have you know, question in my head. You know, all these chanting college students. Do they even know what they're talking about? Is it? I mean, this is a very complex chess game, as you said. Um, are they just chanting slogans? You know, virtue signaling to their local group. You know, I know we're supposed to be against Israel. So okay, I'll just chant gas the Jews or whatever. They don't really mean that. Or or is there a, a sense of anti-Semitism that's always been around in the West and it's just bubbling back up now? What do you what is your sense about that? Unfortunately, I think both can be true at the same time. There is there there could be a a deeper kind of cultural anti-Semitism that moved over from Europe to America. Some might call it the old world anti-Semitism, the traditional Western world anti-Semitism, where if one defines the West as Christendom and you look at the history of the Jewish people on the European continent. Some might say that that might operate at a base level. Um, that could be one thing. There's also the other thing, which is the political layer leveled on top of that, more of the internationalist kind of progressive left, that school of, anti, uh, of anti-Semitism layered on top of that cultural foundation. On top of that could be, as you mentioned, the politics of the moment, which is the, I think this is the Douglas Murray, the madness of crowds or the critical masses uh, that would gravitate towards whatever one group is doing to virtue signal and the desire to be associated uh, positively with whatever that is and mindlessly chanting these things. And all of this on its own, but especially when together, uh, makes for a very intoxicating, very dangerous brew that is leaving, leading to very unsafe situations, uh, not just on college campuses, but uh, in some workplaces, uh, in some major American cities, in some places of worship, as you know, there's a lot of unfortunate stories uh, coming out of the Western world about this. And it's showing a, a disunity and a division in the Western world that plays to the narrative of America's authoritarian adversaries. Uh, you know, you saw the Soviet Union try to do this 
uh, during the Cold War so many times use and abuse the issue of civil rights. Uh, you know, I have news for you. Those tactics have moved on. Uh, the Islamic Republic, I'll give you an example, uh, the former president, quote unquote, uh, of Iran, because the president of Iran does not at all have the presidential powers of a U.S. president, for example. They have a position called Supreme Leader, who that title is meant to be taken rather literally, Supreme Leader. And the president of Iran in, in 2020, if I believe, during COVID, gave a virtual address to the U.N., and he cited George Floyd. He tried to liken Iran to being George Floyd. Uh, in 2021, uh, Iran had a new president, Ibrahim Raisi, and he also uh, gave an address to the UN, and he also drew on the politics of the moment. He talked about January 6th. He talked about America's botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. He talked about these being the images uh, that define America. So word to the wise, wherever one stands at home, uh, not to give America's authoritarian adversaries that extra card to play. Um, and unfortunately, because of our debates are so public and they're so vitriolic, where everyone is on the, the depth of the free speech issue, uh, we should take note that America's adversaries are taking note. Uh, so I know that that is a bit further than the cultural question of anti-Semitism on American campuses and the nature of some professors and the nature of some Middle East Studies departments. I won't venture to, to talk too much about that because I know you've had better guests, more qualified than I, to shed light on the nature of the American Academy. Um, but you add all these things together yeah. and it becomes a very toxic brew. Yeah, I like that because no human action is as a single cause. Uh, it's almost always multi-causal and people have m multiple motivations. So it could be a number of these different things happening all at once. But my point was that since you made the earlier point that I the Iranian regime would like to see America disconnect itself from Israel to a certain extent, so maybe they're hoping that if the left is pushed hard enough, the Biden regime will back off from providing financial support for Israel, something like that. You know, there is, um, it may be, maybe, let me speak to this in a parallel, that, that is a parallel found in Iranian hacking. Uh, if one pays attention to some of these uh, quarterly or semi-annual reports put out by Microsoft and Facebook, for example, in 2018, 2019, uh, when people were looking at, in those organizations, state-sponsored spoofing of accounts or hacking of accounts, um, you would see Iran try to spoof or amplify voices, I should say, across social media and using electronic means on the progressive left. Why? It's not an ideological affinity about the values of what progressivism means within American society. It was a cognizance that the ascendance of a certain flank in American domestic politics would correlate to a certain foreign policy behavior or a certain foreign policy disposition, where you could say kind of crudely, crassly, that the progressive left would be against sanctions and against pressure on the regime and therefore likely to see America as the cause of the original sin in the U.S.-Iran crisis and therefore more inclined to support diplomacy and incentives and cash payments and more inclined to back away. And it's the ability of America's adversaries to connect the dots between different domestic groups and their most likely foreign policy uh, orientation. I think the Russians are quite capable of doing the same on the other side, which is uh, another group you could call the alt-right, for example. Look at the accounts that the Russians may want to spoof or amplify across the, the social media and digital media landscape. They might understand that a more traditional, narrower, not isolationist, but more judiciously defined definition of the American national interest will mean certainly pulling back uh, from Ukraine, will mean certainly revisiting the idea of American support to NATO. And in so doing, by amplifying one domestic voice, you get to effectuate a different foreign policy orientation. So that's what I mean by America's authoritarian adversaries playing judo uh, with us because of the nature of our debates. And again, they're so public. Yeah, so the American policy about Israel, we wanna support them because they're a democracy. Um, you know, we have a Judeo-Christian um, foundation, so they're kind of our people. Um, you know, the, after World War II, we wanted to, you know, help them, help the Jews, and, and so on and so forth. And they have a strong democracy in a unstable area like the Middle East and oil and all the, whatever the motives are we have for supporting Israel. What, would, what is Iran's interpretation of why America supports Israel? They, it can't be, well, they just want to support another democracy. They, they, they probably have some other nefarious motive that they think is going on. It's certainly more ideological, certainly more based on the narrative of the, the founding father, if I can abscond with this phrase, 
of the uh, Islamic Republic, which is uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, who, uh, this is a man who actually in the pre-revolutionary period when uh, Iran was not led by a series of theocrats, but a, a U.S. allied monarch uh, during the much early to mid parts of the Cold War. And uh, uh, this Ayatollah's protests against the modernization drive of that former monarch uh, led him to cut his teeth on the issues of the day. And the Ayatollah Khomeini cut his teeth on the issue of Israel-Palestine, Israel in the Arab world, is Israel in the Islamic world, and brought forward that narrative of Israel as a quote-unquote colonial outpost. And so in many of his speeches before Khomeini was uh, exiled from Iran in the 60s, in many of his speeches, uh, you see these old world anti-Semitic slurs merged with new world anti-Israel, anti-Zionist themes. I think, you know, Bernard Lewis talked about this very well in his book, Semites and Anti-Semites, where it's the, the paradox of how can a minority be so powerful? How are you supposed to socially push back against this group? And in, in essence, uh, you began to see in the third world this pushback uh, on Jews and on Zionism in the discourse of Ayatollah Khomeini to use Jews as a slur or to use Israel as a slur. Uh, when he called out uh, the late Shah's pro-Israel policies, he would say, is the Shah Israeli? That's meant to be a slur. Um, things of that effect, uh, saying that how could a handful of quote-unquote wretched Jews uh, band together? So, you know, this is playing to the old world, you know, weak, dispossessed, downtrodden Jew, that they couldn't do something uh, like build a state, and therefore it has to be something behind it. It has to be a colonial adventure, a British adventure, uh, tying into that narrative. Uh, and these are things that uh, ideationally were formed in the, in the 60s and 70s and merged with the Islamism and third worldism of these folks uh, and then gained government backing uh, after the 1979 revolution. Um, but this is all ideology and unfortunately you've seen four decades of the Islamic Republic act materially uh, in the service of advancing this ideology. You know, we talked about very early on the Houthis in Yemen, the, the rebel group uh, that is similar but not the same, same sect of Shiite Islam as the uh, Ayatollahs in Iran, but a different variant of that sect. Nonetheless, they support these folks, and the more that material support continues, the lesser the ideational differences between them, because they're shooting at the same people that they want to shoot at. Another example, Hamas is Sunni, the Islamic Republic is Shiite, but they're shooting in the same direction. Uh, and it's, think of it as a big tent ecumenical kind of anti-Israel approach. Uh, and it's one, again, unfortunately, that we've seen them put resources towards uh, for, for four decades now. This is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> uh, yes, but in, a, but in an ideational version yeah, now, which is yeah. constantly expanding the, the tent. They have resonance with this in South America, where there may not even be a Muslim population, but in the tri-border area, where there is a, a, a big uh, Arab world diaspora, particularly Lebanese and Syrian diaspora, uh, Brazil, Argentina, this area. But it also plays to... Uh, for example, the regimes reach into the third world to say that, okay, you may have an anti-America worldview. You may have a leftist-based anti-Israel worldview. Looking for a different, least common denominator angle of entry. You don't have to be Persian. You don't have to be Iranian. You don't have to be Shiite. You don't have to be Muslim. You have to have this political orientation, which is rejectionist. And from there, they can scale up and build up. Uh, it, it's, it's helpful to remember that, for instance, uh, in the U.S., the first ever lone wolf attack that the uh, new uh, regime in Iran in 1979-1980 uh, tried to do was not uh, you know, first uh, you know, to, to bring Hezbollah or the Quds Force or the IRGC or these terror proxies on board. It was to find someone who, had, who was disaffected, had converted, uh, and to channel the anger of their disaffection through the prism of radical Islam and essentially get them to kill someone for them. And he was a, a, dis, a disaffected a young African-American convert to Islam named David Belfield, changed his name to Dawood Salahuddin. And uh, the Iranians wanted him to kill a former Iranian diplomat uh, in Maryland. Uh, and his proposition was, let me kill Kissinger or Brzezinski for you. And they said, no, no, go, go kill this former diplomat. And he did kill him and he absconded and he fled to Iran. Um, so. When I talk about understanding that angle of entry, whether one is looking through social media or through networks or through cultural centers or community centers or embassies, uh, this is the way the Islamic Republic taps into a community that one might think on paper would not uh, be willing to be tapped into by a regime that looks like that. Mm. 
in your Atlantic piece, you you wrote that I think it was the title. If you know, when Iran says they want to eliminate Israel, we should pay attention to what they're saying. They actually mean it. Are there experts or politicians in the West who say, oh, they don't really mean that; they're just speaking metaphorically or something? Yeah, we saw that uh, the, the title of that piece kind of is, is a play on this translation debate. I, you know, I, I watched in real time. Some may remember Iran, uh, many unfortunately of Iranian presidents have uh, hurled insults at the Jewish state, and that's being polite about it. But uh, <laughs> several presidents ago uh, was an individual named Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. He used to be yes, mayor of Tehran yeah. earlier. Um, and he used to come to the U.S. Uh, clad in polyester and reject everything from the U.N., go to Colombia, say there's no gays in Iran. Uh, he actually gained quite a big media following and platform. Uh, but this individual re-upped the line from, again, the founding father of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini, talking about wiping Israel off the map. Yeah. And everyone focused on the transli translation. Is it literal? Is it figurative? Uh, and they also missed this key word, which is must. Both Khomeini and Ahmadinejad used the word must, bayad in Persian. It's imperative. It's a command. It is excised from the context. It's something you must accomplish. Um, and again, you've seen four decades of them act towards that. And just because they don't do so in an overtly uh, crass manner that would invite massive kinetic retaliation against them doesn't mean that they don't harbor uh, you know, homicidal, if not genocidal intentions. Uh, it just means that they're strategic about it, which means it's a fundamentally different and some would say more dangerous type of adversary uh, than, uh, than other adversaries that the uh, Israelis have had to face in the past. Um, can you give us a kind of a big picture of Iran, what, what, what it was like before the 79 revolution and why that happened and what's happened since in the context of why they have this policy of wanting to eliminate Israel? Well, again, this is an example of personnelist policy. The, the people that you have at the helm uh, are the ones that will uh, basically create the policies that set the state on a current direction. You couldn't really have a sharper divide between pre and post uh, revolutionary Iran. You know, I, I'm an Iranian American. I'm born and raised in the States. You know, mother's side uh, had to flee, father's side was already out. I grew up in New York City uh, basically all my life. I'm a first generation Iranian American, Muslim American. Didn't understand, even well before 9 11, the cleavage I would see between the Iran of my family and my ancestors and the language I spoke and uh, the culture that I was, I was proud to have and, 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 and inherit with the madness that uh, one sees on TV. And first-generation Americans typically do have to square this circle, uh, but it became pretty acute pretty fast as to how far uh, that country had fallen. You, could, you can look at it in, in economic terms. It, it was a South Korea or a Japan of, of its heyday and now is uh, far, far, far beyond. And uh, you know, even being able to potentially be in the same um, economic uh, categories as, as those kind of states. But ideologically, politically, uh, it was a major, important U.S. Uh, military and security partner in the region. Um, part of the U.S. over-reliance on Saudi Arabia now uh, is because there used to be this doctrine that the U.S. had in the region, in the Persian Gulf, called the Twin Pillar Doctrine, also called the Nixon Doctrine. Uh, heavily invested in Iran and somewhat invested in Saudi Arabia. Military and energy on the Iranian side and energy and political on the, on the Saudi side. And with the collapse of that architecture, uh, with the fall of the of the late Shah, the, the king of Iran in 1979, uh, the U.S. has been scrambling to recreate something of a security architecture, over-invest in Saudi Arabia, the establishment of CENTCOM, uh, so many different solutions uh, to the lack of another major Muslim Middle Eastern power with oil that was also leaning in the same direction, at least on big picture geopolitical issues. Ideationally, though, uh, you know, Iran was one of two major Muslim uh, non-Arab countries that recognized Israel after its founding. Uh, de facto, Iran did, de jure, Turkey did. And uh, very sadly, if you want to draw a contrast between where those states were then and where they are now, when the Abraham Accords were announced, I believe in September 2020, uh, major condemnation came not from the Arab heartland, uh, but it came first and loudest and in some very crass ways from Ankara and from Tehran, which... Uh, maybe 70 years ago uh, were, again, the de facto and de jure supporters of even recognizing that the idea that there is a Jewish state in this part of the world. Uh, and then many years later, uh, based again on the leadership, personnel as policy, Khamenei in Iran, Erdogan in Turkey, these being the states to oppose uh, Arab-Israeli normalization. Interesting. Occasionally you'll see pictures bouncing around the internet, like on Twitter, 
of what Iran looked like. Just regular people walking around the streets before the revolution. You know, women wearing skirts and long hair and guys wearing bell bottoms or whatever it was in in the 70s. <laughs> you know, so do the people really want still to be free, but they just can't do anything about it? How, how does anybody stand up to a, an autocratic regime? Why don't the Russians overthrow Putin? Uh, good luck with that. Look what happens to uh, any of his enemies. He just kills them. So everyone just keeps their head down and hopes that it, it works out on its own somehow. It's an excellent question, but this is one where widening the aperture, it, it could be very helpful to the American audience. You know, Iran is home to one of the most pro-American populations in the Middle East. And sometimes, you know, these things tend to be correlated in the opposite direction of their governments. They have one of the most anti-American governments, and so they have one of the most pro-American populations. Uh, this is just sometimes the way the cookie crumbles there. But the Iranian people have been protesting for some basic things that you could say would be proto-democracy uh, over, for over a century. Uh, it was one of the first countries in the region, if not the first, to have a constitutional revolution to believe in the rule of man and not the edict of a king or a rule or a fatwa that would come on down from higher above. Uh, they tried to create a judiciary, an independent judiciary, over a hundred years ago in that country. Uh, they used to have a, a, a relatively in the you know, early part of the post-constitutional revolution, early part of the 20th century, uh, a rather robust press. There were fits and starts of uh, robust press uh, in, in that country as well. Uh, Iran had two different sets of, authoritar uh, of authoritarian uh, forms of governance, one modernizing and pro-Western and one more destructive and, and anti-Western. That was the Pahlavi period and this was the Islamic Republic period. Uh, you had social and economic progress and very limited political progress in the Pahlavi period, uh, but with, again, some curtailing of individual rights within a certain context. Again, Cold War, so communist parties were outlawed. And then in the post uh, period, the 1979 period, uh, even those political rights that people wanted to move forward and, and actualize were not realized. And the social and economic uh, rights were actually rolled back as well. There's a line by uh, an Oxford-trained Persianist that wrote a very good history of the 20th century uh, on Iran, and I did a book review of it, I think, in 2014, um, and I recommend it to the audience if they're trying to understand these kind of ideological motivations for how we got to where we are in the history of Iran, which has no border with Israel, uh, but somehow is so intimately involved in this conflict, and to know how this country got to be uh, how it is and where it is. Um, the line about understanding that pivot, that revolution, is that which the Iranian people most sought to uh, preserve, they lost, and that which they sought to reach, they never attained. Uh, that's a pretty good summary of the failed uh, movements uh, in that country. But to bring it to much more contemporary history, uh, in 1999 and 2009, you had major uh, Tehran-based, capital-based, urban, middle and upper class-based protests in that country. 2009, you may remember there was the Green Movement, a stolen election to bring, again, Ahmadinejad back to the helm. Um, you've had a lot of uh, younger college students uh, protesting for reform and then even trying to push the ball towards uh, revolution. But those were so massively cracked down. And even though Iran under the Islamic Republic is an Islamist authoritarian system, it ironically had very high levels of voter turnout because there was a relatively high level of people's interest in exercising those things of democracy, even in an albeit very non-democratic system. Uh, to get the muscle memory of turning out to vote, of following, of campaigning, uh, even against the government at great cost to their life, as you mentioned. Uh, but what we've seen from 2009 to present is the massive crackdown against civil society Iranian protesters. And that's why 2017 to present, we have been witnessing an entire change. No more are the Iranian people talking about reform. They're talking about wholesale revolution, gutting the Islamic Republic top to bottom, bottom to top. Right now, you couldn't have a bigger cleavage between state and society in the Middle East like you do uh, inside Iran today. It's, it's quite rightly why you saw, uh, you know, Iranians in a soccer stadium right after October 7th talking about taking the Palestinian flag when some pro-regime people had been unfurling it at a soccer game and uh, kindly placing it where the sun don't shine. Uh, it's because they're sick of the everything at the expense of Iran. And you could say from 2017 to present, not only are they seeking democratic governance. Not only are they seeking social and economic justice, uh, not only are they seeking representative governance, uh, they're also seeking a government that, for lack of a better word, puts Iran first. Uh, and they simply have not had that for 44 years. Um, and 
unlike in some places like Russia and North Korea, where obviously there's a state society divide and sometimes there's movements against the regime, even in the face of massive violence, we've seen the period of time between protests shrink. Most recently, the protests that were triggered by the killing of a, uh, a young Iranian Kurdish woman, 22-year-old Masa Amini, September of last year, touched off a year of nationwide anti-regime protests that hit 150 different cities, totally different ethnic and demographic and geographic backgrounds. And people who look different and speak a little different uh, and, and think different are united in one view, which is that their present predicament, their present negative predicament, is a result of the Islamic Republic, is a result of the regime in power in Tehran. And in that sense, the Iranian people and the Jewish people uh, have a great deal in common. And, and what happened to the, that protest? Did, did the state squash it? Uh, the protests are actually continuing, albeit oh. on a much smaller scale. It's not the peak that we saw in the fall of last year, where it was 150 different cities, towns, and villages. But uh, if I can make a humble plug, we do have a protest tracker on the FDD.org website uh, that shows you week by week, uh, using entirely open source uh, heat blooms, hmm. uh, where... Nice. Uh, you have people protesting in different jurisdictions. Uh, we link to original tweets or news stories in Persian and in English uh, about some of these protests, um, but they are continuing, and on a, but uh, admittedly on a much smaller scale. And the regime has used violence uh, instrumentally. So just yeah. like uh, they used Hamas to effectuate a political goal, they used violence to achieve a political goal. Here in Iran, they're also using violence to achieve a political goal, to intimidate and repress uh, because this regime, the Islamic Republic, thrives on domestic suppression and foreign aggression. Mm. Can you give us a sense, just on the broad picture of the spread of democracies and the health of democracies around the world? We, one of the memes you hear now is that since, I don't know, 2016 or so, the rise of populism and authoritarianism and religions or democracies in decline. There's a bunch of books, you know, The End of Democracy and so on. Um, it, 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 are democracies in trouble, it, it, or is this just a recency effect or an availability heuristic, and really democracies are still pretty sound around the world? Or Give us your sense. Are you concerned? Uh, I am somewhat concerned, but this is also a measure of where you stand in life depends on where you sit. Mm. Uh, you know, <laughs> those funny. who live in Western yeah. democracies are cognizant of the sea change, even in the discourse, in the social media space, in the yeah. political space. Uh, that has, uh, we've seen really for about a decade, if not a little bit more than a decade, if you broaden out not just the capital, not just social media, but uh, print media, uh, universities, basically what c constitutes the public square uh, and intellectual life in many of these countries. The, the boundaries have certainly changed. Um, this is one of those moments where I think it's one of those quotes attributed to Foucault, the margins are the center. Sometimes the loudest voices uh, seem to simply be the most available voices. So we tend to make the focus uh, of our discussion on how to contest or co-opt or combat or deal with the rise of those loudest voices and, and lose sight of the plane uh, that many who are content with the way things are, the plane that they control. Uh, so you said an availability heuristic. I also think it's, uh, it's something of salience. You know, these voices may have political salience at a point in time, and therefore their effect may be more magnified. Um, it depends how you look at some other regions of the world. Central and Eastern Europe is a little bit different. Not every single fight in the world that's a political fight, that's a geostrategic fight, needs to be recast in the authoritarian versus domestic, or the authoritarian versus democratic paradigm. I actually am one who, despite fully supporting continued U.S. support for uh, Ukraine, thinks that that language can be a little bit unhelpful and you could even have a broader coalition uh, because we simply have geostrategic grievances. One need not recast every single geostrategic grievance uh, into a, an, an ideational grievance. And I was uh, reminded by something you said about the nature of U.S. support to Israel. All of those factors are valid, but all of those factors were not why. For example, uh, the Nixon administration, and you know from the Nixon tapes that uh, Nixon had some rather uncharitable <laughs> views yes. uh, about, Jews, yeah. uh, about uh, you know, uh, Jews. Uh, but nonetheless, the administration, because acting on government policy, acting on that which defines the national interest, had in the, in the 73 war, the airlift that saved Israel. Uh, you know, Henry Kissinger, who also served in that administration, used to say foreign policy is not missionary work. So American, you know, political and military support to Israel is not charity. The U.S. moving 
uh, you know, major naval assets and turning on air and missile defenses in that part of the world, that's not charity. That's because the people who are shooting at the Jewish state are also shooting at American positions. That's because the relationship between the Israeli military and the American military, that's a two-way street. Uh, the terrorists uh, who want to go after uh, the significantly unperforming Muslims in their view, in their midst, as well as the non-Muslims, be it the, the Jews or others, as well as bring that fight onto America and Europe's shores, uh, they are shooting at, at the same people. So it behooves us to stand together and see that sometimes it's, we don't need to make everything an ideational interest because we have such overwhelming and overlapping geostrategic interests. And you couldn't have uh, a sharper divide uh, right now than when you look at the Middle East today. There is clearly good versus bad. But even if one is going to do this amoral foreign policy business, which I think sometimes can be immoral, but even if one is going to try to adopt that lens, this is also something in our interest. Uh, if a group can come into another country and kill 1,400 people, as they did, and think this is going to, and, and you think restraint or turning a blind eye is not, is not going to beget more of this kind of violence, and it's not going to proliferate to Europe and America, you have fundamentally another thing coming. Yeah. Here's how I think about it. But tell me if this sounds right. Let's say there's, at any given time, a dozen hotspots around the world. The United States could do maybe six of the 12 uh, and try to help out. And they're all good causes. The people are being suppressed. The civil rights are being violated and so on. So we're going to pick the six and maybe three of them we can go all in. And so uh, I, I envision people in the back room, the deep staters, whoever, you know, kind of doing the calculation. Well, yes, of course, these people are all good and need our help, but which, which are the ones that will also help us or our allies in NATO or UN countries or something else that will help us uh, as well as help them, something like that. And you end up with Ukraine, Israel, maybe a couple others. There is a, as you were doing the, the math, broadening the picture and then shrinking it out, there used to be this doctrine, um, I don't know what the name of it was, but it used to be where the U.S. could project force. It could it could project force across several different theaters. It could win decisively in one. It could hold off another. Um, I don't think the Pentagon works this way anymore. That was something from the pre-global war on terror into the early phases. It was 2 four, four, one, or I forget the exact ratios, but where they could apply a certain kind of force, where they would have to work by, with, and through a local partner, where they could hold off another adversary, where they could decisively defeat another adversary. That framing is gone, uh, but the need to look at the world strategically, as you mentioned, because uh, good governance is about being cognizant of the fact that you have limited time, limited resources, limited political capital, and effectuating your ideological and strategic goals uh, in a way that you get the highest return on investment. And in some of those areas you mentioned, and I would add standing with the Iranian people to that one, uh, is where you can actually have your values and your interests in the same place and get a high return on investment, uh, which is why America's adversaries often try to throw off support uh, for the Iranian people, uh, for, you know, Ukraine, for Israel, uh, uh, in their own discourse as they push back. Uh, it would be a mistake to think Putin doesn't have a political war he's fighting. It would be a mistake to think Khamenei doesn't have a political war he's fighting. There is a commensurate political strategy to their military strategy. And I think we have to wake up to that. So it would be nice if we could liberate the Iranian people and so they can get back to having a free uh, society like they used to, but we can't just march in and do that. I mean, self-determination, it's none of our business to a certain extent. How would we feel if they, I don't know, came over here and, and, and emboldened protesters, the, I don't know, the BLM or the far right, uh, proud boys, or, you know, we're going to overthrow the U.S. government and you know, something, we would be outraged if they did something like that. So I guess there's only so much we can do. There, there is so much we could do, but uh, you, you mentioned the Proud Boys is very interesting. I, I, I hope that was because you read uh, these uh, Director of National Intelligence public reporting, uh, <laughs> because they did ask, uh, I think in 2020 or 2021, about election meddling, and the right. Iranians did try to meddle in the election. And the well, way they, they did. did it, again, cognizant of the different domestic uh, constituencies, to use the Proud Boys as a threat of domestic violence to drive voting in the other direction. So to impersonate Mili kind of a militarized alt-right, if you will, but to drive voting uh, into the other direction. And they, they attempted to do that through electronic means in the state of Florida. I believe this was publicly reported. Uh, 
in, in, for, in the case of the 2020 election. So again, they're cognizant of these things and they don't have the gloves on when they try to do these things. I think it was even reported somewhere that Iran tried to meddle in the, Scot- the SNP, the Scottish referendum uh, for, for the UK a few years back as well. So again, they have full global reach and they have the Islamic Republic has no qualms uh, with these things. So I think as a predicate, I would say that. The second is, I would say, yeah, no one is calling for, you know, overt military action. And for the U.S. to have to think about standing with a people that it also has a geostrategic interest with, a la Iraq, would handicap us to think that that is the model to stand with people in practice moving forward. Step number one can and should be no more own goals. No more of these bailouts. No more six billion here, 10 billion here. No more paying ransom for hostages. Uh, Doing things that don't empower the regime can begin to move the ball in the right direction. Another example, taking advantage of authorities that already exist, of laws that already exist, of capabilities that presidents and the Congress already have. You know, for example, President Joe Biden inherited a very powerful uh, legal sanctions architecture against the Islamic Republic. Uh, and the, even though I just said that the $6 billion that the regime got and the $10 billion that the regime got, $10 billion this summer via payments in Iraq, $6 billion from the South Koreans, uh, which is now sitting in Qatar, uh, that's $16 billion. That is a drop in the bucket compared to the $95 billion in oil revenues the regime has been permitted to generate, which is still illicit revenue from unenforced U.S. laws that are already on the books and that are atrophying uh, because we fear the Iranian response to the enforcement uh, of some of these penalties. Uh, So step number one, don't empower your adversary and no more own goals. That can move the ball in the right direction. Interesting. I did not know about that. 95 billion, that's a lot. What would they do if we pressed on that? Well, they already are acting like the U.S. policy is regime change. They've been acting like this for more than a few decades. The problem is the more restraint we have shown over the past few years, and this is, as, as you know, everyone has been watching a bipartisan foreign policy problem, uh, the tougher they have become. So now you have a condition where hypothetically tomorrow you have a reversal of heart either within the Biden administration or 2024, there's a political change in Washington and those legal penalties that already exist uh, would be more actively enforced. The kind of people that are at the helm in the Islamic Republic today and their impression, this is a story of change over time. They're looking at different American presidents, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden. Their impression of American resolve, they tell you what they think. When we withdrew from Afghanistan, the commander of the IRGC, designated foreign terrorist organization, it's Iran's ideological army, it's designed not just to protect the borders of the country, it's designed to protect the ideological nature and spread that revolution globally. The I in IRGC is not for Iranian Revolutionary Guard, it's for Islamic Revolutionary Guard. It has a more universalist application in their jurisdiction. They want to apply military force, they're spreading the revolution through military means. These folks said, the commander of, of, this, of this military unit said, the America of today is not the America of 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and this is borne out in practice. Uh, I'm sure you may have not have known, but in September 2022, for the first time ever, Uh, this force, the IRGC, killed a U.S. citizen uh, in Iraq uh, using ballistic missiles. They were striking at northern Iraq, and there was a U.S. citizen, Kurdish Iraqi guy. Um, This is, and and when you kill the the nationals of another country with weapons of war, and the other side does not respond, of course the other side is going to be emboldened. So if, after a certain measure of time, we move to enforce the economic means that we have at our disposal to pressure them, of course the other side is going to respond because they believe that you are bound by a limited period of time. So rightly, we, would, we have to anticipate how the other side is gonna respond and prepare to offset that. I don't think it's wise to put a loaded gun in a shaky hand, but we have to understand that the, the, the more restraint we have, we're not begetting restraint by the other side. And, if, and eventually, even if someone does wanna come and change the situation and take a tougher stance, they're not gonna have the time to do it because the other side has an impression of us of being irresolute. So they're gonna escalate to throw off our escalation. And you saw this in the Iranian responses to the Trump administration. There were shortcomings there too. Again, this is not a partisan criticism. The Iranians shot an American drone out of the sky. We did nothing. After we killed Iran's chief terrorist, Qasem Soleimani, the Iranians fired ballistic missiles, 16 of them at two positions uh, in Iraq. That was the biggest missile barrage in US history uh, that we suffered after the end of World War II. 
who would have known it would have been the Islamic Republic to do this to us? No U.S. military response. Uh, the Iranians, before they sent that drone, uh, starting in 2022 to Russia to kill Ukrainian civilians and attack critical infrastructure, they used that same drone uh, in the summer of 2021 against an Israeli-owned vessel, and they killed a British and a Romanian national. No one did anything. Can you really uh, tell me that the hardened revolutionary Islamist elite of the government of the Islamic Republic would change course immediately and, and beg, uh, beg for forgiveness immediately if they see a slight change in U.S. foreign policy? They'll only do it if they see a sustained change in U.S. foreign policy. Just look at Iraq and Syria today. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, we have so many empirical examples. Um, since the October 7 terrorist attack, uh, starting on October 17th, U.S. positions in Iraq and Syria were hit by rockets and drones 24 times. Not 24 individual rocket and drones, 24 separate instances of rocket and drone attacks. Uh, the U.S. has only responded once. So this uh, emboldens them. Absolutely. This response ratio is way off. And do you think uh, if Trump was president, none of this would have happened? Depends what is the this. Yeah, would it this. be October 7th yeah. or would it be yeah, February October, 24th? Say, or, say October you know, 7th. What, what, what part of the globe are we talking? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess it depends. I don't Just take October 7th. I mean, only because he said on Truth Social, this would have never happened October 7th under my watch. I'm not sure. Uh, the, the, the honest answer is I, I'm not sure. I think the Ukraine situation would have looked drastically different. Uh, I think that's one where the president is not embellishing the record. But in this case, you know, there was the 2021 war, for example, which was early in the Biden administration. It was the 11 day uh, Gaza Israel war with uh, massive amounts of rocket fire. Uh, it's true that there wasn't a major Gaza war, the nature of 2014, uh, the likes of 2014, that was not existing under the Trump period. That is true. That record does hold up. But that kind of permissive behavior uh, towards U.S. forces uh, that congealed in the national security planner's mind in, in Tehran that you can do this, that you will be able to get away with it, that was an incubation period for it. Uh, Trump was better uh, responding to militias in Iraq. He was worse at responding in Syria. He was better about defending the WMD norms whence the Syrians uh, used chemical weapons. Uh, he was much, much better on the oil issue, the sanctions issue, the anti-nuclear uh, deal issue uh, with Tehran. It was qualitatively leaps and bounds better. Uh, some would say he did more politically to at least bridge the gap between Jerusalem uh, and Washington, partially by moving the embassy, partially with the Abraham Accords, partially by downplaying any dirty laundry that may exist between the two capitals. And he did a lot to kind of diminish the saliency of the Palestinian issue and raise the profile of the Iran threat and bring together um, these American partners in the region. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, Israel moved into the CENTCOM uh, U.S. military grouping uh, late in the Trump administration. There are many, many successes he can tout, um, but there are some shortcomings that I think were the incubation period for the Iranians to say that the Americans lack resolve, that we can divide these folks, uh, and that ultimately our death by a thousand cut strategy against Israel uh, should continue apace. Can you make a distinction between Islam and Islamism and the Islamists and this idea of Sharia, spread of Sharia law and so forth in the context of something like the domino a, a theory that drove the Vietnam War? You know, if we let this little country here, which we don't really care about, go communist, then that'll affect the next one, and the next one will fall, and so on. And so we got to draw the line right there. Is that what we're doing? Because of Islamism, is that different from Islam? I, I think, yeah, I think these are, these are different groupings. So Islam is, I think, the world's second biggest religion. It's one of the great religions of the Abrahamic tradition. I'm a Muslim, probably not the best one, but I'm, I'm, I'm one anyway. <laughs> um, th there's two major branches of Islam. It's, it's, it's got a history of when you put a faith and a worldview in positions of power, in empires, they act just like much of Christian Europe acts, like it's an empire that has a coherent ideology that gives it force. Uh, it's a major scriptural tradition. It's, again, one of the great religions, and it's housed in American academia as a Western religion. Uh, it has those traits that differentiate it from Shintoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism uh, of the Eastern world. Uh, that's Islam. Uh, Islam, like Judaism, is a, re is a legalist religion, but like Christianity, is a universalist religion. So it's an interesting kind of theological compare and contrast. 
and it believes it's the it inherited much of the tradition uh, from both of those folks. So uh, there used to be uh, slurs uh, and and polemics written even in by among Arab Christians that you know, early Muslims were actually you know backwards Jews because they had all the legalism uh, of, of Judaism, but they had this universal claim that Christianity had. It was not bound to a people or a context or a geographic uh, zone. That's that's Islam. Um, again, so second world, second biggest religion came out of that milieu. Uh, Islamists, or Islamism, I should say, is political Islam. It's a relatively new phenomenon. It's about 200-ish years old. Uh, there's great people who have focused on the what went wrong issue from Sir Hamilton Gibb to Bernard Lewis. Uh, and it is one of those political domestic reactions within the Islamic world once the material world proves to them that they are not the number one power anymore. Uh, that they are beaten by Christian Europe, that they're falling behind Christian Europe, uh, and they're looking for, quote-unquote, a way to answer what went wrong. And in essence, uh, one, the Islamists line, there's a nationalist line, there's a constitutionalist line, there's a you know, more fundamentalist line. Uh, the Islamist line is that we are insufficiently good Muslims and we have to make our government a vehicle that allows us to be better Muslims. And those are folks you can contest or co-opt politically if you have a genuinely democratic system. Uh, but at the same time, uh, those are folks who are able to build political followings based off of civil society and charities. So unless they become violent, they can be contested and controlled and co-opted within a democratic polity. Now, there are going to be some that uh, have militant branches. There are going to be some that are going to be much more peaceful. Uh, but it's one that you want to keep your eye on. Uh, it might be democratic in the sense that it might be majoritarian, uh, but there's always that joke about Islamist elections that Islamists like to come to power through democratic elections, but that'll be the last democratic election. <laughs> right. There'll be kind of a rigging of a situation. Um, I'm unfamiliar with mainly success. I'm, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with mainstream, long-term, successful Islamist parties that are also democratic and also liberal democratic. It's, it's part of the rise of what some might call illiberal majoritarianism. That's Islamist, that's right. Islam. So this... And then the, the most dangerous one is, is, okay, a, is yeah. I think you tried to get into it, which is the jihadist one. This is the uh, yes. radical Islam, yeah. the armed folks. Uh, these are, you can have a state backing it, like the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And then you can also have uh, you know, charities within a state that are not tied to a state uh, do that to fund other acts of violence. So the charities across the Arab world that ended up funneling, uh, you know, money to Al-Qaeda, uh, which engages in acts of terrorism against America, against uh, Muslims across the region. Uh, so you have, you can have state and non-state sponsored acts of jihadism, which you can put that into the, the bucket of radical Islam, the, the ones who use violence against civilians to effectuate their political goal for global domination. I don't think it's the, the domino analogy is, is, is one to one. I think we've had very good success with using military force against some of this jihadist faction. The ISIS is, uh, the counter ISIS mission is a very good example of you have an ascendant jihadist group that uh, is trying to gain territory. When you apply military force, you can limit the spread of that within a territory and then you have to defeat it uh, through other means. But you can control the spread and then, you know, counterattack it. And in areas like the Islamic Republic of Iran, where they're able to get around our military strategy, that has to do more with the shortcomings of our strategy. We disconnect the dots between patron and proxy. We show more restraint when showing pressure early might get us more results down the line. But it's Islam, Islamist, and jihadist. And again, this is the, the by far the dangerous ones. And this is not to demonize the one point uh, four or three billion people, of which I am one uh, in, the, in, the, in the Muslim camp, but it's to show you the gradations from faith to political movement to violent extremist terrorist. And many religions have these, uh, you know, armed versions. There's, you know, Hindu nationalist, Hindu terrorist. Uh, look at what's happening to the Rohingya. Um, but this is the, based on the three different groups you asked, these are the three different categoriz categorizations I tried to offer. Um, okay, so but this would be an argument for why we don't want to let Iran have nuclear weapons, uh, because they would use them. They've said, right, we want to wipe Israel off the map. They might use nuclear weapons to do just that, so we have to stop them. Well, precisely a situation like we're seeing right now, that it's hard to deter the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's hard to get them to listen to what 
Anthony Blinken has said, to what Joe Biden has said, uh, which is don't, uh, don't intervene. It's hard to get them to show the restraint now. And they're emboldened by the capability of their asymmetric assets, the lethality of their terrorist groups, and their assessment of American irresolution, which again, that's a bipartisan foreign policy failure. If you add a nuclear weapon into this, you'd be supercharging that violent scenario. Um, I understand the theoretical uh, assessments of mutually assured destruction. This is where I slightly disagree with Professor Bernard Lewis about the, the nature of the Iranian government. Um, the problem is that it's, it's, it's too means ends rational. It might be too good at doing nuclear blackmail because it's too good right now as doing conventional military blackmail. It has been able to, through its you know, restored relations with Saudis, to get Saudi Arabia and even the UAE to some extent to doubt that America would be a good partner over the long term. It's, being, it's trying to pull apart the region uh, and deal with it you know, one at a time. Salami tactics, the Italians call this Politica del Carciofi, the politics of the artist show. You pull it off one, one leaf at a time and you, and you bite into it. So our goal has been you know, a Middle Eastern NATO, uh, put Israel in CENCOM, uh, joint military exercises together, US force umbrella, US force posture, uh, uniting. And theirs is precisely the opposite, dividing, deal with them one at a time. And they're able to, unfortunately, do this coercive diplomacy successfully uh, because their, their model is a knife and a handshake. Now, if you have a knife, a handshake, and a nuke, then, then it would be a, a really kind of disastrous scenario. So just the world that we're living in today, where Iranian proxies can engage in this multi-directional fire at America and at, at Israel, uh, and we have all these concerns about escalation now without a nuclear weapon, imagine how much harder it would be to quarantine or roll back that escalation if they had a nuclear weapon. And I'm sure there are folks in Tehran today who are looking at the region saying, and this is precisely why we need one. And this is precisely why, to quote Khomeini in the aftermath of the hostage crisis, whose anniversary we're coming up, it was November 4th when those students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1979, and that's precisely why there is no U.S. embassy in Tehran today. Um, when Khomeini said, and he went on TV, and I'll say the Persian, he said, uh, which is, translates to, America cannot do a damn thing. And those hardest of the hardliners in the Islamic Republic, they're saying that same phrase today. If you go for it, America cannot do a damn thing. Uh, let me give you one somewhat frightening analogy, if you don't mind. Uh, earlier this year, it was revealed that the regime had enriched uranium, which is the fissile material you need for a nuclear weapon, to 83.75% purity, almost 84% purity. Not to get too technical, but, you know, perfect, you know, weapons-grade uranium, WGU, weapons-grade uranium, is about 90% purity, uh, what you need for the warhead. Um, when we, the U.S., uh, not we, but when the U.S. dropped a uh, atomic weapons uh, in Japan at the end of World War II, uh, there was one uranium bomb, one plutonium bomb. The uranium bomb that the U.S. enriched was enriched to 80% purity, 8-0. So even less than weapons grade and even less to where the Iranians had managed to enrich to earlier this year. So the perfect is not the enemy of the good. 90% is technically this purest weapons grade level, but one could effectuate the kind of nuclear reaction that one saw at the end of World War II using something beneath that level. You simply have to have more mass, and it's a different you know, mathematical and physics calculation there. Um, Iran is also home to the biggest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East, and uh, Iran also has chemical weapons, despite Iran suffering major chemical attacks from Saddam Hussein's Iraq. There are declassified U.S. government assessments that show Iran briefly experimenting with chemical weapons use on the battlefield against Saddam's Iraq. They fought a war for eight years uh, called the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988. And uh, in those U.S. government assessments that are declassified, they talk about how previously in Iran there were political and religious prohibitions to the use of chemical weapons despite suffering major chemical attacks from Saddam. But when the strategic conditions changed, the religious and political roadblocks were dampened and, you know, paved the way for military use. Um, so those who take solace today in some kind of ridiculous nuclear fatwa that Iran's supreme leader has 
the same thing uh, could happen. Would, is Iran very likely to rush to use the, the, the bomb? No, but that's because they're probably understanding that they can effectuate their goals prior to having to drop one, uh, that they can use it to have a freer hand in the region, but that also one should not dismiss that when they say death to Israel, they mean it. When they say death to America, they mean it. When they emblazon these slogans on their bombs, they mean it. Um, and that for a country that used to have previous guardrails to a different kind of WMD, and those guardrails shrunk over time, and then they ended up using it anyway, uh, those guardrails also are likely to shrink over time if Iran does get uh, a nuclear weapon as well. Not to mention the chain proliferation of nuclear weapons in the region. When you have uh, you know, MBS and Saudi talking about if the Iranians have one, they'll get one. The Pakistanis already have nuclear weapons that could change deterrence there. Egypt and Turkey may go online in a different way. It, it, it's very wise to work to prevent rather than accept an Iranian nuclear bomb. Indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, you know, as a game theoretic strategy, mutual assured destruction assumes the other guy doesn't want to die and doesn't want to destroy his country and so on. Well, if if the versions of Islamism where, you know, you get to be a martyr and live forever uh, uh, by by death to your enemies, why wouldn't you use nuclear weapons? And indeed, this was, uh, this was again, the, uh, uh, there's a Persian saying, which is a heart has a pathway to a heart, which is when you're thinking of something, the other person says it. Um, because uh, when I, I mentioned Professor Lewis intentionally, uh, because he would say, what kind of world is it if mutually assured destruction is not deterrence, but an inducement? Um, oh, so there right. is certainly the messianism of a faction of a, a, lo- a faction of Iran's clergy, uh, as well as a faction of the revolutionary elite. My polite pushback to some of that is, yeah, these guys are messianic, but they're more strategic in the ways they bring it about. Uh, again, I, I worry about an adversary more that can met out punishment over time and to force you as the more responsible party to accept it for fear of provoking them rather than to respond and try to stop them. And that's precisely what they tried to do in in Gaza uh, with the October 7 attack. They tried to say, okay, look, you're going to produce the pictures that prevent you from getting a political victory uh, in Gaza. So therefore, it's best that you absorb the 1,400 civilians and disarm and sit there and pretend like nothing ever happened. The goal is to make the adversary accustomed to getting cut so that the death by a thousand cut strategy uh, ultimately leads to the defeat of their adversaries. Uh, They're not, again, the the, the type to rush and to throw uh, everything that they have into it. Otherwise, I would say they have four decades of uh, capability and one would have believed they would have acted on it by now, but they're acting on it in a different way. And I think that's why assessment, sober assessment of the Iranian strategy is very important to working to restrain them. Yes, that is a concern. Right now, I'd say it's a low probability, high impact concern, but we're failing in the short term concern of deterring and countering and imposing costs on this kind of steady uh, uh, series of attacks that you know we're facing conventionally in the region. So yes, there is this ridiculous martyrology. Uh, you know, the, the chief terrorist of Iran, Qasem Soleimani, who the US killed in 2020, uh, the, Iran, the, the government, in particular Khamenei, the supreme leader, uh, he used to call him the living martyr. Uh, but then after January 2020, they just had to cut the, li- the word <laughs> living and say he's, you know, he's, he's a martyr. And the regime is still looking to extract the blood, the blood money, the blood vengeance, the bloodlust, uh, you could say, uh, because that was such a serious blow uh, to them. Uh, but they're not looking to do it in a way that they lose control. You know, this is a group that is crazy about control. Uh, they un- they see Iran, the, the nation, the country, the people, the resources as a vessel to effectuate their ideational means. And because they're so wedded to those ideational things, the, the you know, the messianism, the, the, the Khomeinist interpretation of 12 or Shiism, because they're so wedded to the anti-Americanism, they're so wedded to the anti-Israel stuff, that they still need a state to propel the ideology. The jealousy of needing the resources is one reason why there is also the restraint in that case. Mm. You said earlier. I hope the... I tried to put that kind yeah, of no, artfully. That was... It's not that they don't have the, yeah, yeah, the view. Got... It's that they're the, mm-hmm. unfortunately it's a it's a it's a judicious adversary, so it can be hard to call out. And again, there's a flank of American society that wants to grant them everything. Uh, so it's, it's a different ball game. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. Earlier in the conversation, you talked about um, a poor states with less technological developed weapons going up against bigger state. Well, I was just thinking of North Vietnamese. You know, they defeated us, as it were, 
They didn't have B-52 bombers and fighter jets and missiles and all that stuff. You know, they just had a lot of people that were very devoted to their cause. This was not a religious cause, a Marxist cause, communist cause. But I was thinking about, you know, if you're Iran and you have these Hamas terrorists, you know, you don't have the kind of weapons we have. And look what it takes and how much money you got to spend to develop, you know, artificial intelligence and these super smart missiles, you know, guided missiles. And I mean, each of these missiles are, you know, tens of millions of dollars you know, and so on and so on. What if you're not even close to that? Well, but evolution created a naturally intelligent uh, machine for you that has hands and feet. If we could only program the brain to want to do the killing for us and die in the process, how can we do that? Well, ideology, religion, <laughs> the promise of an afterlife or being a martyr. You don't. Even, well, as the Marxists showed, you don't even have to offer an afterlife, just some kind of deep cause that people are willing to die for. And so in a way, that's kind of what they're doing. Hey, whether it's a... Uh... To, to get to give the devil his due, the great title of your book, <laughs> which I hope to kind of abscond with. And there, there's an op-ed I'm considering. I haven't I even finalized. Use but, it. It's not uh, mine it's anyway. A, <laughs> <laughs> it's a popular phrase, but yeah. uh, I, it, it is one that if we look at the way the adversary is doing this, exactly as you mentioned, you know, we have to respect the adversary. They've done so much with so little. That's what makes it so scary. That's what makes it so lethal. Uh, and whether you're right, like whether it's to die for a three by five piece of polyester or to die for a book that someone said came on from up high or to die for a piece of land, which someone says came from somewhere else. This is this is the art of, of the way the adversary is able to mobilize masses. And in particular, these masses have uh, they, there is an ideological resonance among these masses to do something which one would say would be illogical or not rational or would not feed the interests of the self because they believe they'd be effectuating or helping the interests of a great of a bigger group, uh, whether that's a faith group or an ethnic group or a country. Um, so this is this is how uh, these are the weapons of the weak, if you will. But they're also ideology can be a weapon of the strong as well. It's not limited to the weak. But I mentioned weapons of the weak because, you know, ISIS, for example, let's go back to the Sunni side of the street versus the Shia side for a second. ISIS, uh, it was fighting an 80 something odd coalition of countries uh, in Iraq and Syria, and was still able to produce drones. So these are weapons of the weak. They understand low cost, high return on investment. They understand exploiting gaps in the adversaries, commercial sector and ways to import, get third party things, reverse engineer. That's precisely how Iran in the 1980s had no ballistic missiles, and today is home to the largest ballistic missile arsenal. Reverse engineering, procurement, production, proliferation, uh, and it's and it's a and it's a program they've perfected on steroids. Where do they and get the money places, for that? Uh, some of this is cheap. Some of this is oil money, um, and and some of this is you know gaps in our architecture, export control architecture, uh, some transshipment hubs like UAE, Malaysia, Hong Kong, China, Central Europe being more permissive jurisdictions for this kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, there's lots of ways to trace that, but to every different proxy in the Middle East, they get a different weapon. Uh, and what Iran has done since uh, in the northern tier, Israel has been striking, uh, you know, the, the Syrian regime and Lebanese Hezbollah in Syria, who is trafficking uh, or receiving from the Iranians who are trafficking uh, components to turn rockets into missiles. Um, rather than ship whole systems, or rather than ship component parts, what the regime has advertised they're doing vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians is to work on indigenous production. So using local tools, local tech with foreign tech and foreign assistance. So foreign guy comes with blueprint, local uh, fertilizer, uh, local tubing. Uh, and this marriage of local equipment and kind of foreign inspiration or foreign guidance has been the secret sauce for the rockets of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So this is this is this and this is the one proxy in the entire you know belt of what they call the axis of resistance that has only rockets, not missiles. The other folks they have rockets and or missiles. You know, missiles are guided, rockets are unguided. That's the big difference. Uh, and the Houthis have cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, stuff that can reach Israel. Uh, they also have drones. The Iraqi militias have drones and rockets, very few missiles. Uh, the Syrian regime has the arsenal of the Syrian regime. 
but then the Iraqi militias also go to Syria to support that regime. Every proxy gets a different tool. Uh, but these are all weapons, ways to contest uh, the traditional tools of conventional American or conventional Israeli military power. Uh, and so that's their attempt to offset it. I will also say this, because you mentioned cost. Uh, in the 2021 war, uh, Gaza-Israel, the 11-day war, Iranian hardline media outlets tied to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, were ranning kind of braggadocious headlines about whether you intercept the rocket fire or not, you lose. And they were pointing out the success of the Tamir interceptor of the Iron Dome batteries, uh, noting the cost disparity, that it's much cheaper for Iran and the proxies to fire their rockets because the cost of the interceptor is higher. So you either have to absorb the potential cost of the rocket landing in a non-preplanned area, or of the cost of having to use something more expensive to shoot something less expensive out of the sky. Ukrainians have this problem with Iranian drones. The Saudis were taking up American jets to shoot down Yemeni drones that originally came from Iran. These are, these are ways that weaker adversaries use tech to their advantage because they know about the cost curve. That's why some of these things are harder to fight and that's why some of these weapons of the weak really do land powerful blows. Uh, and again, this is an adversary that understands that, is home to the biggest arsenal, and has spent the past decade perfecting this arsenal, both for nuclear use as well as for this conventional use, and then been proliferating some of these shorter and medium range things to this, you know, axis of resistance that it calls, so that I could do what we're seeing today in real time, which is to slowly surround Israel uh, with this kind of uh, fire from multi multiple directions. So if Iran is the patron to Hamas, does Iran have a patron or multiple patrons or partners that are equal that help fund all this? You know, Iran, this is, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned this because our, our conversation has been mostly Middle East specific. Uh, and for a lot of folks in Washington, a lot of folks in America who really couldn't give a damn about the Middle East, they might say, you know, people have been fighting each other for a thousand years, so what doesn't affect me? Actually, it does because our adversaries have enablers. And it's not just people who might give them lip service on universities or in social media. China, for example, uh, for over a decade has been the biggest legal and illegal importer of Iranian oil. When mm. we're talking about under really? the Biden administration, the regime being able to generate 95 billion uh, worth of oil sales, the vast majority of that is vis-a-vis -vis China. So, this quarantining of the Middle East doesn't touch our other great power competition problems is not just intellectually dishonest, it's empirically unfounded, it's not true. Russia and Iran, yes, for the past 500 years have had mistrust, have had enmity, have had ideological and political issues, but that has not prevented these two countries from being able to come together and shoot in the same direction. There is no reason why a country like Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, needs to be fighting NATO. But nonetheless, they feel so emboldened that they are giving Russia these drones and potentially, soon in the future, potentially close range or short range ballistic missiles uh, to allow the Russians to conserve their own stockpile of missiles uh, to keep the Russians in the military war effort against Ukraine longer. So they're buying time for the Russian military machine with these weapons of the week. So Iran has patrons. Uh, on the Security Council, Russia and China have a veto. They can essentially block anything that they would believe would be anti-Islamic uh, Republic there. Uh, those patrons are moving closer to trying to pull American partners like the UAE and Saudi closer uh, to China. Uh, even on Israel's adversary side, you see this weird game going on right now with Russia and Hamas. And it's going to have implications because, you know, Russia is already the, uh, a big supporter of the Assad regime in Syria. Uh, this is a geopolitical chessboard. The world is not neat and parsimonious. And as odious of a regime as the Islamic Republic is, it actually has great power support in terms of political, military, security, and intelligence ties with America's major great power competitors, which are Russia and China. So it's, again, time we connect the dots, not disconnect the dots on this threat. Yeah, so in that context, then, do economic sanctions against Iran by the United States and maybe UK or whoever else work? Or do they just have so many other options, it's just a minor irritation to them? Well, a, a economy the size and the scale 
and the level of integration, like the Islamic Republic of Iran, was a perfect test case for financial sanctions. Because the, even the Biden administration, which did not like unilateral sanctions, which did not like far-reaching extraterritorial sanctions, uh, admitted that in the multilateral period, in the Obama era, in 2013 to 2015, that it was American sanctions that got the Iranians to cry on coal to come to the table that ultimately led to the nuclear deal. We have qualms with the way that was negotiated, but the ouch part of that equation was brought to you by uh, economic sanctions. There is no doubt about that. No doubt about that in my mind, and even no doubt about that in the minds of people who are skeptics of this foreign policy tool. The application of it to an economy uh, like a Russian economy or a Chinese economy, which is more integrated, and you have to be able to offset their offsets is going to be harder. But even under the Trump administration, which restored those penalties and built on those penalties, so used economic sanctions as its major foreign policy tool against the Islamic Republic, even then the regime was able to find ways to breathe. That doesn't mean the sanctions didn't work. It means the sanctions, again, always have to be enforced, but they need a longer time horizon. And if you have a government like the Trump administration, which is willing to run the clock and willing to enforce over time, you need to give them a big birthway. You need to give them a big landing strip to implement and enforce over time. But the Trump administration left the nuclear deal on May 8th, 2018. Then on November 5th, 2018, it restored the oil sanctions. Then it finally cut all the oil waivers by May 2019. So effectively, maximum pressure, the name of that sanctions policy, was only in effect from May 2019 to January 2021. Uh, it's going to take a little bit more time than that. The problem is the Iranians understand that, and they contested this policy, and they found ways to breathe around it. Uh, and now, under three years of unenforced sanctions, compared to the enforcement of that previous time, uh, they're generating more revenue. And they're finding ways to barter with countries that are increasingly finding themselves the subject of American and European economic sanctions. There is no silver bullet, just as you rightly said uh, at the <laughs> beginning, really that funny. there is nothing that's monocausal. So there you but just, it's a key oh. ingredient in making your adversary fight with one arm behind its back. Right. So and we gonna have ride, to be willing may, to bring on the other forces online. Maybe just ride it out until the next American election and hope that the Democrats get in power and maybe they'll loosen up a little bit. <laughs> God, and I think crazy. that's precisely what they did from 2019 to 2021. They were right. cognizant yeah. of different domestic group leads to a different foreign policy orientation. Amazing. All right, Ben, I don't want to uh, press you on time for too much, but I do want to ask you, since you study democracies, about the American democracy. You know, we're coming up on 2024. Are you worried about our democracy at, at any level? Yeah, I'm worried. There are, there are certainly friends who uh, show me clips of some of my old commentary about Iran's quote-unquote elections, and this is not a moral equivalency in the slightest. There's no way you could compare the government of the Islamic Republic and its quote-unquote elections to what we've got going on here. But there was a line I would say, and there's a line many people have said, which is, uh, it's a shame that the Iranian people over time have always had to settle between bad and worse. And uh, moving into 2024, there's a lot of people who are not excited, uh, and they feel like it's a settle between bad and worse on different fronts. Uh, there's people who like certain things of certain individuals and perhaps not the behavior or disposition of them. Uh, and, and vice versa. Um, but listen, I think it's the experiment that matters. America is as much of a kind of civic experiment that you renew in your day-to-day -day service to this country. It's a very different kind of nationalism. It's a civic nationalism, very different from the French and German model. Um, and that requires this optimism and it's, it's inherentory, inherent a participatory kind of system. Uh, and if we're simply you know, pushing away from the table on the issue, I think that's where a lot of the pessimism will manifest itself into something in the material world, in the real world. Um, so I say stay engaged. I say follow. I say sometimes hold your nose and vote. Uh, you know, the organization is, is, is nonpartisan. It's a nonprofit think tank focusing on foreign policy and national security. We have literally zero uh, domestic, you know, programs here. Some think tanks have tax policy centers, healthcare policy centers. Uh, you know, will, will we advise folks on both sides of the aisle? I continue to have that, that privilege to have, you know, my analysis shared with folks on both sides of the aisle and different administrations. Um, but I, I, I do worry more about the culture than the politics. I'm reminded of the, the Moynihan quote about, you know, conservatives worry about the, uh, the culture. I, I am worried about the culture here, um, the culture on campuses, uh, the culture on social, social media, the devaluing of the family. I'm worried about this culture um, because one of the ways it manifests itself 
is into the political sphere of the dampening of those guardrails, the throwing back of those guardrails, uh, the saying of things that are really un impossible to unhear after you hear some folks saying it. Uh, culture matters um, everywhere, but especially uh, in, a, in a place like America, where it's a civic kind of national. Yeah, so you mean the polarization and the just the hateful language people throw at each other across the political aisles is just hard to believe. Uh, how could that not affect the way you actually feel about somebody? Uh, and yeah. The rendering of your neighbor, your friend, your acquaintance, your family member, of, of, of anyone as a, not just a political adversary, but an enemy. Uh, I find that to be right. dangerous. Right. Well, there's stories about, you know, politicians, co congressmen and senators on the opposite sides of the aisle. On the weekends, they'd, you know, have their families over. They'd play softball together, whatever. You know, we differ on the tax percentage, or but, but, but we're still friends. And apparently that's not the case anymore. Yeah, that, that, that merriment, that kind of shared centrist stuff, I see a lot of that corroding. Um, I don't think it's immediately bad that there are folks who go back to their districts to spend more time in the communities that elected them, uh, you know, and make sure that, you know, you do have to vote your district and vote your conscience. That was from uh, th that uh, Frank Underwood show on mm -hmm. Netflix. That's what he would advise them after he would whip them. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying that the rest of this is a whipping, but um, going back to your community doesn't necessarily mean you need to be polarized, but it, mean, it needs you, you have to find a way to represent your district and your community uh, within what's left of that system uh, in Washington. Yeah. I got to tell you, Ben, I study a lot of different really complex, hard subjects, in, mostly in science, you know, physics, quantum physics, and general relativity, and uh, you know, genetics, and I don't know what. They're all really hard. But what you do seems even way harder. <laughs> There's so many pieces on the board to move around, and they change by the you know hour, day, week, and you know, how do you keep track of all that stuff? And, and if you were a statesman or politician, you know, like, okay, we're going to intervene over here. I mean, the example I use, you know, Clinton failed to intervene in Rwanda and then get, got hammered. Why didn't you intervene there? And then he intervened somewhere else. Why did you go over there? Look what happened. And it seems like no matter what you do, at best, six good things happen because of it, but five bad things happen because you intervene. And maybe you get one one little, you know, point uh, above the uh, above the negative ledger there, <laughs> and that's the best you can hope for. Listen, it's hard, but ultimately, it, in some way, it's it's more art, and you do more science. Yes, there is a empirical rigor. Yes, there's a method. There's a method to the madness, even. Uh, but a lot of this stuff is based on again priorities. Limited time, limited money means you have to learn to prioritize. Um, I'm not a politician. I don't work in the U.S. government. I've actually never worked in the U.S. government. Um, but for those who do serve or who aspire to serve, it is about being able to prioritize. And I think it's also about having the right heuristics and then also remembering that personnel is policy. If you have a team, whether you're a business person or a politician or someone in philanthropy or whatever, the people that you surround yourself with should challenge you. You don't always want to be the smartest person in the room. You want to learn. You want to listen. Actively listening is a very, very hard thing. There's uh, I know I talked quite a bit on this podcast, so forgive me, sir, but actively well, listening right. <laughs> is, is, is quite a hard thing. Um, yeah, and, that's and, my job here. <laughs> and I, 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 try, I try to listen as much as I speak, um, you know, for the, for the actual Iran stuff, you know, all this open source online, you have to be, you have to love what you do. And eventually, if you love it sufficiently and you give it the time, any discipline, if you give it the time, uh, you'll develop the skill set to assess change over time or stasis over time. And that'll give you knowledge about trends. And those trends will be able to help you predict is a very dangerous word in Washington and in foreign policy, but to make sense of several most likely trajectories and least likely trajectories. And if you can game plan out, having not just a plan A and a B, but a C and a D, uh, that'll make you the most uh, informed person or one of the most informed people on these issues. Uh, but you have to love it, and, and, and it's certainly not a nine to five. Uh, you know that better than I. You, you've, you've done right. uh, great things from the five to nine part. You must get up in the morning and go, okay, let's see what happened today. <laughs> and yes, and also because Iran time is eight and a half hours yes, ahead. Exactly, and I think Israel right. is seven. Right. Uh, so right. They, they are going through lunch and dinner when you're you know, just starting the day. So you do need this kind of rigorous checking of what, you know, what happened, when did it happen, um, what, there's what a method new, to the madness. What, what news sources do you trust? Or do you listen to? 
uh, I try to consume as much as I can and then and then and then you know go go in different directions. This is not at all an endorsement of it, but in the Iranian media space, obviously it's not a free media space. It's all semi-government or government. But if I'm trying to figure out a particular weapon system, I would say, okay, well, some folks have an incentive to misrepresent, but I would look at, you know, the regime reporting that is most tied to the military to give me the most information on this issue. Then you would cross-check it with social media. Then you would cross-check if this missile system has similar specs uh, in other places with similar missile programs. Um, but in terms of news, like American news, like this, this yeah. was like a small snapshot of the method um, to, to, to get a particular factoid down. But in terms of American news, I, I try to consume as much as I can. Uh, I don't have a cable I mean, I TV sort of feel subscription. Like I'm, I'm safe with uh, Associated Press, ABC, CBS, NBC, probably going to try to do get the story straight. I don't really trust CNN or Fox or the other ones on the either, either more extreme I don't know, PBS, I think, I think the Wall Street Journal, I don't know, it's hard to say. Yeah, and, and I think there too, it's more art than science, some shows may be better, some shows may be worse. Again, personnel is policy, so much of this can come down to an editorial decision or a producer decision, uh, but the reason I'm refraining from giving one outlet or one network or one show uh, is because I don't want to denigrate or hold one up yeah, or platform sure. or put one yeah, down. Yeah. Right. Um, but one thing that all will suffer from and have been suffering from is, you know, the infotainmentization of, of, of the news. And then for other folks, and this is, I mean this with immense respect, this is not your podcast or not other podcasts, but the other institutions where the heuristic of, okay, this is trustworthy and I, I trust this fact because I trust this institution behind this fact. And that institution be, uh, has a certain amount of social cachet and this had mm. a certain time to congeal, we also have to understand that the new media space doesn't have this yet. So finding right. those pillars of credibility right. are going to be very challenging. Mm. And, you know, where you stand in life depends on where you sit. So you can use different people as heuristics. Look where they hang their hats. Look where they kind of cluster. And perhaps that could give us some indication of credibility or reliability, but credibility and reliability with a certain audience. Right. All right, perfect place to end. Thank you so much, Benham. I really appreciate it. Let's have you on uh, six months or a year from now and see how it, it, it unfolds by then. <laughs> Would love to, hopefully in better times. Thank you, yes. Michael. A real honor. Thank you.